Let's pray and we will get into uh, the word this evening. Father, I thank you that you are good and that you have bountifully supplied everything that we need for life and for godliness. That's conformity to your image through the power and the spirit of your son, Jesus Christ. God, we yield ourselves to you tonight. Father, open the eyes of our understanding. Fill our hearts with not only knowledge, but desire to execute your word in this earth on your behalf. In Jesus' name, amen. Um, a lot of the times, uh, this time of year, uh, one reason I like to teach on hope, Hope is Born is the name of the current series that we're in, and we're going to be going deeper tonight, kind of along those same lines. Uh, one of the reasons I like doing that this time of year is because, let's just be honest, for a lot of people, the holidays are a reminder of people who have been lost, maybe loved ones that have gone on to be with the Lord, or maybe a reminder of seasons in our lives when maybe we had certain relationships and those relationships are no longer viable, or there's, there's a lot of reasons that we can slip into depression or, or whatever. Uh, so I think it's important, plus it gets cold. The days are shorter. You know, it's dark at 5 o'clock. So anyway, I, it's always good to, to have a series based on the idea of hope, and I think this is really good timing for it. But I, I talk very often about avoiding what I call the cycle of, of death or the spiral of death concerning depression. And um, maybe you've never battled with depression. Maybe you never deal with it. But, but a lot of people deal with depression. Um, we're going to read about a, a particular psalmist. You, you might be amazed to, de- to, to learn that David, according to his psalms, struggled a lot with despair and depression and hopelessness. And he answered a lot of the challenges that we face uh, concerning some of those same issues. Uh, one of the Psalms, Psalm 27, 13, and 14, is, is just an amazing psalm. When I was studying this out earlier today, I, I saw here clearly that David is warning us, us of the danger of falling into despair or hopelessness, and, and he offers some experiential insight into avoiding it. And I couldn't, I couldn't help. I, I was like, I gotta, I gotta share this. I gotta share this tonight. Uh, maybe this is not for you right now, but there's a good chance it could be for you in the future for somebody that you're, you you know, or in or are in relationship. You can use some of what we're going to go over tonight to really help and and reach for people who may be in bad circumstances or situations. Uh, let me just read it, and we'll go from there. Psalms 27, 13 through 14 says this, and this is, again, the psalmist in this particular instance is, is David. He said, I would have despaired unless I had believed. So I, I mean, you could stop right there and, and see the contrast. Despair and hopelessness, the counterbalance, the offset, the power to overcome is contained in the believing. I would have despaired unless I had believed. So we're seeing something from the very onset. That I would see the goodness of the Lord in the land of the living. Now, does that mean manifested in this life? Or does it mean that he was able to observe it even from the perspective of this life? I would say yes and yes. He said this, and then he gives us some incredible instruction, instructions concerning this, some experiential insight to avoiding despair. He said, wait for the Lord. Very profound statement. We're going to examine that a little deeper. Be strong and let your heart take courage. Yes, wait upon the Lord, or yes, wait for the Lord. And he reiterates that twice there. Very, very important. So I want to begin by going over five keys to overcoming despair. Uh, and he's, he's shown us several. The first one I spoke of just briefly, one is to extend your faith. He said, I would have despaired had I not believed. So he was, he was intentional. Uh, the moment that we dare to hope we enter what I refer to as the arena of faith. I'm going to, I'm going to talk to you about 
three elements to engage in faith or three elements necessary for you to effectively engage in faith. But I got to tell you, you make a conscious decision to either extend your faith and begin to believe for something or you choose not to. The moment, and, and I would challenge you at any time, even tonight, think of something that you dare to believe God for and extend your faith for it tonight. Now, now, what I'm going to share with you, some of the elements for engaging your faith, I want you to consider these elements before you decide to engage your faith because we always need to engage our, our faith properly. Um, and once you engage your faith, it's not something that you pull back. Once you say, I'm going to believe, I'm going to trust, there are certain things that you kind of set in motion, and I can promise you, there's nothing and there's no way for you to be pleasing to God outside of engaging your faith. When was the last time that you intentionally said, I am going to believe for this thing? Because I'll tell you, when you do that, the ears of God himself perk up and angels look over the banisters of heaven to see what's going to happen next. But that's not the only person paying, paying, paying attention. I can promise you, all hell will assail you. And everything that is that is inherently on the inside of you, rises in opposition to the faith to which you were called to, to live in. The just shall live, shall function, shall make habitually their habitat, their dwelling, and their way of life by faith. We're sustained the same way we're saved, which is by faith. So extending your faith, three aspects of, of doing that successfully. If you're ever going to extend your faith, you should first plant on a promise. Plant your feet intentionally on a promise. Extend your faith for something that you know that God has validated in his word. Something that you know is sure, a firm foundation. Uh, Jesus said it this way, those who hear my word and do my word are like the ones who built on a rock. Those who are believing according to the word of God are believing on something that is absolutely sure. If you're not sure it's God's will, then you're not sure if you should even be believing for it in the first place, right? Because he said this, he said, we know that if we ask anything according to his will, that he hears us. You don't even know he hears you unless you know it's according to his will. How can you exercise faith if you don't even believe in your heart of hearts that God even really heard you in the first place? But if you know that you're asking something that you know is according to God's will, then you have the assurance of heaven and the word of God that says he hears you. And if you know that he hears you, it says explicitly, then you have the thing that you're asking for. So first and foremost, before you extend your faith, extend it by planting it in a firm foundation. Plant on a promise, which is the revealed word of God. Second aspect is very important. Check your motives. Before you extend your faith, even if you have a promise that you want to believe God for, you need to check your motives. You say, what do you mean, Pastor Tony? The Bible says this. It says you ask, but you ask amiss. You ask so that you can get and then turn around and spend what you get on your own selfish pleasures. My wife was reading this verse to me in James, which is where it's talked about. And, and I won't even say, read a verse in James. You should just, it's a short enough book. You should always just read the whole book because there's plenty in there to convict of sin, righteousness, and judgment. I'm just going to tell you. But in the book of James, it says very clearly, you ask and you have not because you ask with wrong motives. Your motives aren't to advance the kingdom. Your motives aren't to enhance the lives of others. So we, we see right there a glimpse of what it looks like for Christians to get. Our desire to get should be out of a motive to increase our giving. If it's not, he's very clearly, I want you to think about that. And think about why you would ask God for something. Because I see people all the time, I'm believing God for a new car. Well, is yours broke? No. But I can't impress people with the one I have. So check your motives. According to the word of God, it says, if we ask with wrong motives, we are asking amiss. And then it tells very often what our motives are, that we should spend the getting that we get from God's supernatural blessing on our own fleshly desires. In other words, God, I don't think is in the, in the business of blessing us solely so we can use it to gratify the desires of our own flesh. I, can't, I look at that in the Bible and go, well, that's, that's not a valid, it's not a valid reason. To meet our needs, yeah. 
I've never, saw the right, I've never seen the righteous forsaken or their children begging bread. But if you're believing God for money to go on that next cruise, I'm just saying, check your motives. Huge. Because if your heart condemns you before God and you have a question concerning your motive or concerning the promise, you will not be able to extend and remain in faith concerning that particular thing. Real stuff. Number three, test your peace. Anytime I decide, Jesus said it this way. He said, before a man builds, he counts the cost. Before a man goes to war, he considers the resources that he has and the troops and the opposition that he'll face. Test your peace. I may have promises in the word of God. I may have good motives for those particular promises, but listen to this. It may not be God's timing for those things in my life. So so what happens? These three all reflect something. Think about this. If you go back and you think about a promise, it's God's will. If you think about your motive, it's God's way. And if you think about the third one, the test of your peace, it's God's timing. So before you extend your faith, something I would always suggest you consider, if you're going to st- extend it and see the fruit of that happen and see God move, it's going, to take, it's going to take those. Planning on a promise, checking your motives, testing your faith. So that's the first key in overcoming despair is to extend your faith. You overcome fear with faith. Number two is determine to wait patiently. Now, this is huge. This is the second part. Anytime you extend your faith, you're saying, God, I believe that you want this for my life. I believe I'm asking with right motives that you do this or accomplish this thing in me or in my life. Now, God, I'm in this thing for the long haul. I believe it's your timing. Determined to wait patiently. Now, this is something that he said at the onset of the scripture. You'll remember He said, I would have despaired, I would have believed. And then the first thing he says is, wait for the Lord. So determine to wait and wait patiently. Very important. So Ephesians 6.13 tells us us something that's that's really cool. It's it's how we are empowered for patience. Now, Now, something you have to understand about patience, very, very, very important about patience. If, If you don't understand that something is for a purpose, you will never endure the pain. Do you understand? You have to understand that there is a purpose before you're willing to endure the pain. Patience is all about understanding the purpose that empowers you to endure the pain to get to the, to the, the, the profit, so to speak, the payoff. And that's what patience does. Patience understands that the pain has a payoff. Your flesh may die. You may have to sacrifice your fear on the altar of faith, but, sh- but the payoff is that you grow in conformity to Christ and you grow in, in favor with God and with man. Man as far as being a godly example and God being pleasing because you're operating in faith twofold. Now Ephesians 6, 13, 17 tells us, tells us primarily how we can be equipped to wait patiently. I'll read it. You jot that down. The whole scripture was too much to put on one slide, and I didn't want to split up the slide, so I'll just read it to you. It says, therefore, and many of you have heard this, but don't tune out because there's six main elements in here that I want to pull out. Uh, Therefore, put on the full armor of God so that when the day of evil comes, temptation, despair, opposition, whatever it looks like, you may be able to stand your ground. And after having done everything, stand. Now, here's where the patience That's what he says. It takes patience. Exercise patience that you may receive the promise. So after you've done everything, stand. Stand firm then, having the belt of truth buckled around your waist, with the breastplate of righteousness in place, and with your feet fitted with the readiness that comes from the gospel of peace. In addition to all of this, take up the shield of faith, with which you can extinguish all the flaming arrows of the evil one. The arrows are equivalent to accusations. All the accusations that would tell you that the promise of God is not true. All of the very accusations that caused Adam to fall in the garden. Has God said, maybe this isn't the time. That's why it's so important to count the cost beforehand. Because if you get in this battle, I can promise you, the enemy is going to throw it at you. Your own fallen nature is going to be fighting against itself because patience is not something that's natural to us not something we enjoy. Waiting is not something that comes natural to most people. 
Uh, unless it's waiting to go to work, and that seems to be really easy for some reason. I don't get we may have that problem. I got a lot of patience when it comes to showing up at work on time anyway. Um, your feet fitted with a readiness from the gospel of peace. In addition to all, take up the shield of faith with which you can extinguish all the flaming arrows of the evil one. Take the helmet of salvation and the sword of the spirit, which is the word of God. Now, um, I want to talk to you really quick after we determine to wait patiently about the elements in there that will give us the power to patiently wait. So we understand that the first element is truth. It says put on the belt or the, uh, the belt of truth. Gird your waist with the belt of truth. The interesting thing about the belt of truth when it comes to the Roman armor is all of the armor was held in place by the belt. Literally. Your breastplate, the greaves even, all hinged and hung and connected to the, the belt. So if you didn't have truth, if you didn't have the belt to begin with, all the other armor was, was somewhat loose. Uh, very often the helmet itself would even att attach to the breastplate, uh, which would run around the back of the neck, hold the helmet in place to keep it from getting knocked off if it fell back, and that would extend on down again even to the belt of truth. So, But anyway, truth is absolutely, absolutely huge. The uh, second one is uh, righteousness. Now, he said put on the breastplate of righteousness. Now, the interesting thing about this is righteousness equals clear conscience from God. Now, why is that important? Because he said this. He said, if your heart condemns you, how much more God? In other words, if you're not living to the standard that is in your own heart, that is a conviction... If you're not even pleased with your right doing, do you think God will be? Well, there will always be that question. Therefore, it's an inhibitor to your faith. Now, I'm, not, I'm talking about functionally, not positionally. And we can get into that theologically at a, at a different point. But, but, but truth, righteousness, right being before God. And you're going to see why that is important and how that happens. Right being and right doing. Anytime you hear the word righteousness in the Bible, rightness with, rightness in the eyes of God, rightness in relationship with God, positionally as well as relationally. You've been made the rightness of God where? In Christ Jesus. That's why he said, if you abide in me and I abide in you, you can ask anything you want. Why? Because you're living consistently with your position. A Christian who walks in sin is a Christian who is living inconsistently with who they are. You've heard me say it before. An unbeliever who does good is living inconsistently and has no moral basis wherewith to do good or a reason to do good. If you don't believe in God and you don't have a moral, uh, a moral anchor in your life, tell me why you would even bother doing good. You've, you've seen the signs. Do random acts of kindness. Why would you do random acts of kindness? If there is no God and you're looking at it from a, from a, 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 a humanistic perspective, what is that going to do? I'll tell you what it's going to do. It's going to ease your conscience, which says there's a God regardless of what you say. And that's what people try to do. So they're like, okay, well, let's offset and come up with, with some strange inspiration to get people to do what they know they should be doing on the inside because they're created on Mago Day in the image of God and their very soul is convicting them and they won't release from it when there's only one lasting relief and that is rightness with God provided only by Jesus Christ. And we'll get to that in just a minute, which is the gospel. Having your feet shod with the preparation of the gospel of peace. What is that gospel of peace? Because you will not have rightness or right standing and doing and being before God without the gospel of peace. The gospel of peace is the gospel of the good news that through Christ there's peace between God and man. Peace on earth, goodwill towards men. Whose? God's goodwill towards men. Why? Because of the birth of Jesus Christ, which would ultimately lead to the death of Jesus Christ, which would once again allow God to have goodwill towards men. Why? Because to that point, God had been hostile towards all of humanity. His righteousness, back up one, his righteousness dictated hostility towards humanity because of their treasonous, rebellious iniquity, continually. Few in the Old Testament exhibited faith, which was to do good based on belief in God's existence out of fear and obedience with God. They were saved in the Old Testament the same way they're saved in the New Testament. You understand, nobody was saved by the law. How did salvation happen in the Old Testament? Same way it did in the New Testament. Through faith. Faith in God. So having our feet, it says, 
shod with the preparation of the gospel. Now, this is, this is kind of interesting because when I, when I really begin to look and dig into this, it's, it's the readiness is the aspect that it's focusing on. Now, I've not heard that taught a whole lot, and it's almost like they skip over that. We talk about the truth, we talk about the righteousness, and then we skip over the, the, your feet shod with the readiness or the preparation of the gospel. It's the preparedness. And I think a lot of times that's what happens. We're not prepared. We're not prepared when the, in the heat of battle to absolutely embrace the gospel of peace on our behalf and share openly with those around you. Again, if you're reaching for somebody else, if you're going to have an effect in somebody else's life, it's not going to be because of your incredible apologetics. You understand? Your apologetic approach to somebody, the reason that you believe what you believe will not save them. What you believe will save them. Now, to have a reason why you believe that, absolutely beautiful. That's icing. But the gospel of Jesus Christ is the cake. The gospel of Jesus Christ is the power of God unto salvation. Listen to this. For us first. Because the first thing the enemy is going to do is cause you to question your own salvation. If you're not prepared and understand that you are the righteousness of God in Christ Jesus because of nothing that you have done, but solely because of his sacrifice, I can promise you, every time you falter, your faith will fail. And God never designed it to be that way. Your faith should not be in your ability to obey him, but his ability to save you to the, other mo- to the uttermost. And I think that's huge. We don't put faith in faith. And people have done that. Oh, I'm going I'm to build up my faith so I can get more. I'm not believing in faith. I'm believing in the God. I'm, belie- I'm trusting in God. I don't trust in my ability to even trust. But I trust in the object of my faith or belief, which is the fourth one. If we are going to wait patiently, we must be rooted in the truth. We must be in a place of right being and doing before God, right standing with God. We must be concrete in our understanding and application of the gospel of peace in our lives first and those around us. And fourth, we must remain constant in faith. It's going to allow us to stand patiently in the face of opposition. Through faith, you cast down the accusations and the faith, again, based on the truth, the word, the promise. That's why I said if your faith, if you're going to extend your faith, first of all, it has to be in a, you have to plant it on a promise because that's what the enemy is going to come. Think about it. Everything that will cause you to fail will come as a result of, of the enemy saying, you think God really meant that? Or, or even better, let's be honest. He didn't say, does God really mean that? He said, you think God really meant that for you? Yeah. You, you think that promise is for, is for you? Who do you think you are? That promise is there, but I mean, who are you? Well, fortunately, if, you're, if, we're, if we're studied in the Word of God, we understand that God is no respecter of persons. What does that mean? It means He doesn't elevate one necessarily in His sight above the other. We have a level pre- uh, playing ground, and whoever will dare to trust and believe God, that's the one God honors. He's not a respecter of persons. He doesn't care about your, your, your socioeconomic sta- economic status. I'm not concerned about your education. I'm concerned about how how much money you have or don't have in the bank. God loves you because you are made in the image of God, and there's not certain image bearers of God who are more image carriers than others. Anybody who believes that, and people used to believe that, you've bought into a lie. Faith will allow you to wait patiently. Truth, you must have to wait patiently, and the gospel understanding must have. And the other one is salvation. Kind of begins with that. I see these as almost going in reverse. This is the helmet of salvation, a mindset that God is going to show up. God is our salvation. I think that kind of is his name. Jesus, Joshua, going back to some of the original languages, our salvation. Think about that. A mindset. He said, set your minds not on things below but on Christ where he is seated at the right hand of the father do you realize that when you do that you are literally setting your mind on salvation when you set your mind on Jesus never let him get never let that relational aspect that communal aspect that communicational aspect with Jesus get too far out of your mind keep your mind focused where it should be 
he actually gives us a list. He says, think on these things, whatsoever things are good and lovely. He gives us an exhaustive list of what we can think about as opposed to what's wrong with me, what could go wrong, what could happen, who could hurt me, what tragedy could befall me. Now, here's the problem. That's our natural slant. So we're not only fighting against an external adversary, we're dealing with an, inter an internal brokenness. When I say that, that's what iniquity is. Iniquity, and we talk about sin, which is the expression of, iniquity is the inherent motivation of our doing wrong. That we're constantly strapped with. That, that God despises and died to have eradicated from us. And that's the difference. When you inhabit this new body, it will be void the tainting of sin. Remember Paul said it this way. The sin in my members. He was referring to the iniquity. The very thing on the inside of me that makes me hate what I am. I've had people say, I, I hate what I do. I just don't have the power to overcome it. And we don't, but we're going to get to that in just a minute. Now, he said also, um, the word of God, which is the sword of the Spirit. Now, this particular word, you know, there's two words for word in the Bible. One word is logos, which literally means the written word of God. This is not that word. He said, take the sword of the Spirit, which is the word of God. It is the word rhema. It is that word inspired by the Spirit of God in your life at that moment, and he says, you fight with it. What does that mean? That means that there should be a firm expectation for every believer that at the point of conflict, the inspired Word of God via the Holy Spirit will roll up into our spirits, into our minds, and we will war according to that Word, that inspired Word of God that is applicable for that moment. You've had it. You've had it happen. You recognize the voice of God when it happens. You've probably, it, for some of you, it's like breathing. Somebody will come to you and they'll say something to you. You are not worthy. You are a sorry. And all of a sudden, the Holy Ghost is going, you're the righteousness of God in Christ Jesus. Shut up, devil. Some of you who may not be as proficient as in, in wielding that sword or recognizing that will go, you know, what is right? I suck. <laughs> That's, again, sharpening our skills intentionally to discern good from evil. That's our intention. That is maturity, you know. As you grow, learning more and more to more and more quickly cast down every thought and every imagination that exalts itself against the knowledge of God. Listen to this. Having in a readiness to revenge all disobedience when our obedience is fulfilled. Is that from the outside or is that from the inside? Yes, absolutely. But how does that happen? By the renewing, and, and it, it says the washing of the water of the word. I've got to tell you this. Have I got time? I've got a minute. Um, there are times in my life where life kind of gets me down. I, I don't know. Maybe you don't deal with that. There's times when, when it is difficult for me to make a decision. My mind and my thinking is, is not clear, but it up here, it, it's convoluted because of different choices and, and, and weighty decisions and things that will affect me or, or my family or my friends or people I love or or somebody somewhere, and, and there are times where I will just stop. My kids will attest to this, and they'll come in in the morning, and I'm sitting there with half a cup of coffee or a whole cup of coffee or an empty cup of coffee, depending on when they come in, and, and I'm just reading my word. Because I, I'll tell you, something happens. There are times when I will take a verse, and I will, I will plumb that verse, and I will think, think about that verse, and I'll meditate on that verse. We always consider the, the implication and the application of a verse when we read it. But there are times when I will just take this psalm, the book of Psalms or the book of Proverbs, and I will just begin to read. And, it is, and I will read massive amounts of the word. I'll do two, three, four, five, six, seven chapters, maybe even a book um, at a time. And I will just tell you, something happens. The washing of the water of the word. You know, Woody, I'm going to put you out, Woody, but Woody has this thing where he reads through the Bible 
you know, every year. Are you reading through the Bible this year? You just finished it again. I think he's lapped me. I'll, ju- I'll just tell you. But anyway, um, and, and, and there will be certain things that God inspires as you read. But there'll be times when I'm just reading. But, but when, I, when I get up from those times... That dedicated 30, 40, 50 minutes, hour of, of reading the Word of God. And I'll just be honest with you that my soul is refreshed, 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 refreshed. My mind is clear. Try it. Just if you haven't done it in a while, just try it. Start your day that way, or even better, end your day that way. And start and end your day that way. It's really good. It's like taking a bath in the morning and going around and then washing the stuff off of you at night. I really enjoy it in the morning and in at the night. But anyway, that word of God, um, that, is, and, and that is the logos. It is that washing of the water of the word. But there is that rhema for the moment that you're facing, and God will be there. And the last one is, I go back to the, to the front, it is, it is resolve. He said, and remember how we started this, we said, when, when you have done all to stand, stand, therefore. So that last aspect, when you extend your, pay, your faith, if you're going to wait patiently in order to overcome, you're going to have to extend your resolve. Okay, um, number three, he said, extend your faith, determine to wait patiently, and then be strong. Or he said, be strengthened. Now, that, one, that one's good. Let me, let me read this. Because there's a particular way that we as believers are to be strengthened. Uh, it's not going to the gym. It's not eating right, necessarily. But Ephesians 6.10, is, which is the beginning of what we just said, is the key to it all. Finally, be strong in the Lord and in the strength of His might. Do you know how to tell when you're in His strength or you're in yours? You, you're tired. When you become bedraggled, when you become tired. When you begin to become exhausted, you can rest assured you're operating in your strength. He said, those that wait upon the Lord will renew their strength. They will mount up with wings as eagles. They will run and not grow weary. They will walk and not faint. What does that mean? They will run. There will be times when you, when extreme circumstances calls for extreme measures, and you'll be ready for those periods. Anybody who's a business owner, you understand this. There's something called feast and famine. There's a time when you got to go. You'll run and not grow weary. And then there's other times when your business and your life will only thrive through patient consistency. Patient consistency. Patiently. Consistently. Now, it's one thing. I'll be honest with you. I, I, I like running. I like, I like the full-out sprint. Probably more difficult for me to to walk and not faint than it is to run and not grow weary. I'm almost in, I'm I'm motivated by opposition. This this is personality. Your personality may be different. When opposition comes, there's the thrill of the hunt kind of thing for me. It's like, all right, it's battle time. Get ready. And and then, but, but there's other times that are just as important that we need to be strengthened in. I seek God in those times. I, like oppos- I don't like opposition, but I appreciate the presence that I feel when I'm facing junk. I can't believe I just said that. God, I, I faced enough junk. I'll take a reprieve. Don't take me seriously on this. I'm pr- anyway, you understand what I'm saying. There's always, you want to run, but there, there needs to be reprieve. But the walk and not weary, or walk and not faint, that one's, that one's huge. But finally, be strong in the Lord and in the strength of His might. We ask for his strength daily. I am telling you, Paul said, when I am weak, that is when I'm strong. When I have resolved that I'm going to fight these battles on him. So what is the number one way that you engage his strength in the middle of your battle? It is so simple. I know you know what it is. We pray. We prayer invites the power because prayer is acknowledging the presence. And that's the difference maker. It's a difference maker in our lives. We're the babies. Let God be God. He's a lot better at running our lives than we are. He's a lot better at fighting the battles, and he has a lot more strength than we do. Number four, take courage. Um, This one is interesting. Uh, As as the psalmist said this, I want to read it just to remind you of of the scripture that we're reading. He said, I would have despaired unless I had believed that I would see the goodness of the Lord in the land of the living. Wait for the Lord, be strong, and let your heart take courage. Let your heart take courage. And then he says again, yes, wait on the Lord. 
Um, take courage, interesting, interesting phrase there. I was looking this up and kind of studying out in the, in the original Hebrew, and it says, be established in a courageous attitude. Listen, and I know we don't always associate with this with Christianity, but what he is saying there is put on courage as a lifestyle. Now, now I think that that equates somewhat with choosing to engage in faith in the first place. If you're going to engage your faith, I'm just going to tell you, it takes a bit of courage to even do that. Why? Because what you do, you do in the face of, of the obvious. What is the obvious? There's an opportunity for great disappointment that you can absolutely avoid by choosing not to believe for anything, right? So when you extend yourself, and let's be, let's be honest, there's a lot of things that we don't ask God for because... I, there's a chance we might get disappointed. Or we might lose faith in God if he doesn't come through. And, and, and maybe that's because we're more aware of our weakness and our inability than we are really in tune with his strength and his power on our behalf. All of these have been, have been keys to kind of turn that tide in our lives. But he said, take courage. Let your soul take courage. Take it. Why does he say take it? Because let's just be honest with you, it doesn't just come naturally. I, you know, me, I'm, man, I, I'll just tell you, I am a, I'm a, I, I like to avoid conflict. I, I'm not, I know you, you, you might say that I don't, you don't strike me as that kind of person. I am, I'm, I'm conflict averse. I would rather deal with something. I would rather not deal with it. And, and I think most people are, are kind of that way and just hope, why, why can't we all just get along? I just want to get along with people. I just won't get along. No, y'all just won't get, I just, just get along. Y'all just be nice so I ain't ever got to say anything to you. I promise you. If I'm talking to you about something that's awkward for you, it took courage for me to have to do that because I didn't want to do that. Why don't you just do what's right and I never have to talk to you about it? Think about it. It's a lot harder for you to go to somebody than it is for them to hear it. If you come to me because I've offended you or hurt you, I see you as courageous. You understand, if, I, if I've said something, you're courageous because you're, you're courageously saying, if I've been offended by something, you need to go to that person. I say it often, if you talk to the person, you're building a bridge. If you talk about them, you're building a case. Don't, don't ever get caught building a case. But, you know, we want to do this. So take courage. That's number four. And number five, I come back to this, extend your faith. And he, I say this because he said it twice. He said, wait for the Lord. Now, I want to read that one. I'm going to end with this one, and then I'm going to make, I'll make the point, and, and, and everybody can go home. Implication. Application. Okay. All right. I would have despaired unless I had believed that I would see the goodness of the Lord in the land of the living. Wait for the Lord. Be strong. Wait for the Lord. Be strong and let your heart take courage. And then he comes back again and says, yes, wait for the Lord. Here's what he's saying. It is not a thing. You've got to remember this. When you extend your faith, it is not a thing that you are waiting for, but a person that you are waiting on. Every good gift comes from the Father above. And we get all confused. Do, do, do you see now, now, guys, I know that is simple, but that, that's a still water that'll run deep if you'll think about that for just a minute. I'm going to read it one more time. Remember, it is not a thing that you are waiting on, or it's not a thing that you are waiting for, but a person you are waiting on. That'll help you with your attitude. That'll help you with never becoming entitled. It'll always make faith extended based on relationship not entitlement or obligation and it'll put you in, a, in the mindset of Moses if I don't get the person you can keep the promise now if your child had that attitude towards you here's a great gift daddy fine that's a gift but that gift will cause me to not be around you as much and I'd rather have you than that gift oh my gracious you'll give that kid anything wouldn't you Think about it, the light. You give the kid something. You give the kid a, a video game or you give the kid a, a motorcycle and the kid says, Dad, I really appreciate this and that's great. But if you don't have a bike to ride with me, 
it ain't going to do me a whole lot of good. You'd be like, I raised that kid right. Listen, remember, it's not a thing we're waiting for, but it's a person that we're waiting on. Stand if you're able and we'll pray and we'll get out of here. Don't be overcome by despair. Don't fall into the spiral of death and depression. And, and, and I'll give you one big key. The more you think about you, the more miserable you'll be. The more you think about God and the more you think about others, the more free you will be. I promise you. I promise you. But one of the most difficult things that you will ever do is get you off your mind. It takes faith for you to abandon yourself to God. I remember Pastor Dan said years ago something that just blew up in my heart and it it made so much sense. He said, I realized something. I'm God's mess. I'm a mess. But I'm God's mess. And he has committed through his promises and through the blood of his son to make me something different and to make me something better. He said that work that he began inside of every single one of us, he will keep on doing that work through the power of his Holy Spirit until the day that we are brought into the perfection of the image of his son, Jesus Christ. Man, come on. So you can, you can rest assured and you can rest easy knowing that God is never going to give up on you. Amen? Is that a good thing? All right. So, Father, God, we thank you that that work that you started inside of us, that you will bring to completion, you will conform us to the image of your son, Jesus Christ. And that's what we want so much, Father. That's why we're here tonight. Not to learn to be better people, but to yield ourselves more fully to you, that your life would flow into and out of us more freely. Father God, if there's anybody here who doesn't know you tonight, I'm asking you, Father, by the power of your Holy Spirit, that you would draw them to you. Draw them to understand and to know that incredible love that you have for them and for us. We give you the praise and the honor and the glory in Jesus' name. Amen. God bless you. Thank you so much. You'll have a good evening.